So far, we've looked exclusively at how action potentials get propagated down the length of the neuron to the axon terminal. This lecture explores what happens once you get to that axon terminal. What's the next step? Most of the time, the axon terminal is sitting very close to another cell. And that structure where you have an axon terminal and some part of another cell that is sitting very close to it is called a synapse. Most synapses are chemical because the way that the first cell talks to the second cell that it's sitting very close to is through some sort of chemical signal, most often a neurotransmitter. So the first thing we're going to do is take some time to diagram out a chemical synapse. If you have multiple colored pens or pencils, this is an excellent time to use them. So let's first draw a simplified version of my neuron. And we'll give this neuron two axon terminals. And I'm going to have one of those axon terminals synapse to the cell body of another neuron. So what we're going to do is draw what's in that little box right there. All right, this little button that you see here, it almost looks like a Hershey's Kiss. This is clearly the axon terminal. And then underneath it in purple is going to be the cell that it's going to talk to or communicate with. And so the cell that it's communicating with, it's clearly sitting very close to either a cell body or a dendrite of another neuron. Now the entire arrangement is a synapse, meaning it includes the axon terminal of one cell, the space in between the two cells, and the receiving cell of that communication. So we actually describe the two cells as follows. The cell that is giving the signal, which is going to be this one right here, is called the presynaptic cell. The space in between them is called the synaptic cleft. And the receiving cell is called the postsynaptic cell. And flow of information is going to be in that direction. So in addition, the presynaptic cell is going to contain some chemicals stored in vesicles. That chemical is typically a neurotransmitter, which is going to act as a type of paracrine. So let's go ahead and draw some vesicles. And we're going to put some neurotransmitter in there. I'll use a blue dot for my neurotransmitter. And so the neurotransmitter is packaged and stored in these vesicles. In addition, what we're about to see is pretty energetically expensive. And so the cell will typically keep mitochondria down here as well to help reliably generate energy. Okay, I'm going to add more details in a little bit, but I want to go through the basic overview of what's going to happen, the third grade reading level of what's going to happen. Essentially, action potentials are going to come down to the axon terminal, and that is somehow going to result in the movement of these vesicles to this edge of the plasma membrane. 
and this is going to be exocytosis, such that these membranes will fuse here, and then this neurotransmitter will effectively be secreted into the synaptic cleft. Well, that neurotransmitter is a paracrine, and its target cell is the postsynaptic cell. Again, in our example, it's another neuron. So that means that the postsynaptic cell is going to need to have some sort of receptor for that neurotransmitter embedded in its membrane. So you can probably guess what happens next. These neurotransmitters diffuse out and start binding to the receptors embedded in the postsynaptic cell. And whenever a ligand binds to a receptor, that usually is going to initiate some sort of response. And we don't know what that response is yet. It largely depends on the type of receptor that you have. But that's the basic gist of what is going to happen at a chemical synapse. This image here shows a whole lot of what I drew. So I'm only displaying it to reinforce what I drew in case my drawing wasn't clear. But your drawing should have a reference point and then the expanded version. And you can see here that we have the presynaptic cell. That's the cell secreting the neurotransmitter. And then this is the postsynaptic cell. There's neurotransmitters stored in vesicles. There's mitochondria for energy. You can see that somehow the vesicles fuse with the plasma membrane, and that causes secretion. And then you have binding to some receptor. It's not too terribly complicated. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and tell the whole story and add in some details. So we'll bring this right up to a college level. So our first step is going to be action potentials are going to propagate down the axon terminal. Okay, embedded in the axon terminal are going to be voltage-sensitive calcium gates that I am highlighting here. They show it in green, but I tend to use pink for calcium, so I'm going to go ahead and recolor these. And these voltage-sensitive calcium gates are going to open in response to the depolarization of the action potential. So that's going to be our step two. So once these voltage-sensitive calcium gates are open, calcium is going to be allowed to diffuse down its chemical gradient. Well, that means we have to remember where calcium is concentrated. And calcium is concentrated in the extracellular fluid. It's not terribly concentrated, but it is more concentrated in the extracellular fluid. So we expect a little bit of calcium to trickle in. And that calcium is actually going to bind to receptors for calcium on the vesicles themselves. So it's not just the plasma membrane that can express receptors. Vesicles also have receptors. Calcium binding to the vesicles is what triggers the movement of those vesicles to the membrane where they will fuse with the membrane and secrete the neurotransmitter. So this is what triggers exocytosis. <laughs> 
All right, that neurotransmitter, when it is secreted, is going to diffuse throughout the synaptic cleft. Now, in order to have maximal efficacy and a minimum time diffusing, we really need to minimize our distance. So here we see an example of the structure function relationship where the synaptic cleft is very, very, very narrow so that the neurotransmitter doesn't have very far to diffuse and can bind to the receptor on the postsynaptic cell very, very quickly. So depending on what that receptor is, there will be some sort of response in the postsynaptic cell, and that is step five, that kind of unsatisfying response. That is really used as a placeholder until we get a better look at what the receptor is. So we're gonna be looking at those receptors in just a moment. But before we do, I wanted to go ahead and show you a very similar type of drawing and the same types of steps. Again, this is just confirmation of what I wrote out. Okay, so now we're going to look at this. What is the receptor in the postsynaptic cell? And so what is the response? And this really is going to tie in some information from our cell-to-cell -cell communication lectures. So receptors really tend to fall into two categories here. They can be gated ion channels. Or G protein coupled receptors. And I'll just put the abbreviation in there. If it is a gated ion channel, what is the stimulus? Is it voltage sensitive, chemically gated, mechanically gated? And it might not be entirely obvious that it's going to be chemically gated. So let's actually put that in here. The neurotransmitter is the chemical that's going to open a gated ion channel. So let's focus on this first. If our receptor in our postsynaptic cell is a chemically gated ion channel, what is the response going to be of that postsynaptic cell? Well, let's take a look. If I have neurotransmitter binding to some gated channel that then causes that channel protein to open, that's going to allow the flow of a particular ion through. What if my receptor was a sodium-gated channel? What do you think would happen? Is sodium going to want to move into the postsynaptic cell or out of the postsynaptic cell? And hopefully you said into the postsynaptic cell because we know that sodium is always concentrated outside of the cell. So sodium always wants to come in. So sodium is going to want to come in. What's that going to do to the membrane potential of my postsynaptic cell right here, right in this localized spot. Is it going to depolarize or hyperpolarize? Remember, it's still a neuron. It still has a resting membrane potential of minus 70, even at the cell bodies and the dendrites. So that is going to cause depolarization. So now I'd like you to look at these other questions. What if the receptor isn't a sodium-gated channel, but rather a potassium-gated channel or a chloride-gated channel? What's going to happen to the membrane potential if our receptor is one of those? And again, we're just looking at the postsynaptic cell, the receiving cell of this signal. <laughs> 
All right, briefly, if it's a potassium gated channel, then potassium is going to want to move out of the cell. And that's going to take positive charge with it, making the inside of the cell more negative, And that is going to cause hyperpolarization. Likewise, if it's a gated chloride channel, chloride is going to want to come into the cell, bringing more negative charge with it. And that is also going to be hyperpolarization. So let's come back up here. And if our postsynaptic cell receptor is a chemically gated ion channel, and it's a sodium ion channel, then the cell response is going to be a localized depolarization. But if our chemically gated ion channel lets potassium or chloride through, then our cellular response is going to be localized hyperpolarization. So what is the significance of these responses? Well, that's going to be something we'll cover in another lecture, but we will get there. For now, let's consider that our postsynaptic cell receptor is a G protein coupled receptor. What is the response going to be? Well, that's a little bit harder because G protein coupled receptors activate all kinds of pathways. And so all I want you to know for my class is that if the postsynaptic cell receptor is a G protein coupled receptor and not a gated ion channel, then the cellular response is going to be something else. It's not going to be a change in the membrane potential. So if the receptor is a G protein coupled receptor, then the big takeaway is the cellular response is not usually a change in the membrane potential. All right, that concludes this lecture where we've explored a chemical synapse its structure, the processes that occur at a chemical synapse, and then what some of the different responses in the postsynaptic cell might be, depending on what type of receptor we have. In our next lecture, we're going to be taking a look at some different neurotransmitters and what types of receptors they tend to be paired with, and then what types of effects they tend to exert. I'll see you then.